Hey guys, today's video is going to look a little bit different than our general hunting and fishing type content. And that's because I'm traveling up to Iowa to meet up with Greg Clements from The Hunting Public. Greg is an incredible self-filmer and he's going to be sharing his knowledge with us today. So if you're interested in getting better at self-filming, this video is for you. The destination is on your right. Here we go. Alright, well I'm here in, uh, with Greg Clements in his studio, which is kind of surreal. It's pretty cool to be here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad to have you here. Yeah, we're going to jump straight into the into the, the content here. Greg has been self-filming for over a decade. How long have you been self-filming for now? Mm, I think I got my first camera when I was 16 or 17, so I'm 40 now, so about 25 years. Wow. Yeah. Been so, a while. <laughs> yeah, you've had a lot of experiences, um, a lot of experience with it in a lot of different situations, and I know watching your content, like, I strive for what you do. You, you make really great videos. We're going to pick Greg's brain a little bit here today. Um, the topic is is more of rather than how to get the, the shot on the animal, we're focusing mm -hmm. more on how to tell the entire story around um, sure. the hunt. So we're going to focus on um, practical steps and, and really how Greg captures his footage. We're going to hopefully dive into that. I just happened to see myself in the LCD there and realized like my head is perfectly <laughs> behind that. Like, it looks like I'm wearing a turkey thing. So anyways. I noticed that sometimes you like to start your filming process in your truck is mm -hmm. where the video starts. Sometimes it's at your house. Sometimes it's in the woods. So what is your, your, your goal and what are you thinking before you start filming? Yeah, certainly. You mentioned earlier, like it's, you're, you're trying to tell a story. So it's all, all about that story. And you know, sometimes the story begins maybe at your computer, you're looking at the weather, maybe you got a weather front coming in, or maybe you're looking at the map, trying to decide where you're going to go. Like it just kind of depends on the story for that day, or maybe the story of a season. And then also trying to, you know, change it up a little bit, um, be creative in how you introduce a hunt, you know, not always just doing it in a, in the truck doing a, a long five minute interview just in the truck, like just trying to change it up a little bit. And I find that, you know, one thing that's really important in telling a story is keeping the pacing interesting, you know, keeping things moving. So I try to do it to where I'm not spending too much time in any one place. You're like, you're trying to move the story forward, you know, maybe a little bit of filming, putting the equipment in the truck, you know, something to kind of kick things off. And then maybe you do a short interview or maybe just say something like, you know, here we go. You know, say what day it is and here we go. And then maybe on the road, you talk about how long of a drive you have or maybe some of the weather conditions or something like that. And then maybe once you get to your spot, you do another interview as you're walking in. So as you can see, you're building the story but keeping it moving quickly. Now sometimes I'm thinking back to one of my, or a couple of my hunts where I've done like a little bit of a, a more of an extended interview while I'm driving out to the, out to the spot where I'm gonna hunt. And it's just because there's like a little bit of backstory to tell though there. So I'm just trying to tell that backstory and keep things moving. But, you know, sometimes when an interview goes a little bit longer, you know, the thought is to keep that pacing moving is to have footage to go over the top of it. Mm, B -roll. So don't, yeah, I never, yeah, B-roll or, you know, historical footage or whatever the case may be. But it's always about, you know, adv advancing the story and keeping that pacing, you know, moving quick. So you're thinking about the story you're telling before you start telling it. Yeah. Essentially, like exactly. I, I'm thinking of that hunt in Nebraska where the buck bedded down out in front of you for a long time on that hill. Mm -hmm. You gave a lot of backstory driving up there because you're from Nebraska, and on that on that area, you're kind of explaining what was going on. Right. And I imagine you had planned that out kind of beforehand. It didn't just happen off the cuff. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, this is what I want to talk about going into this hunt. Yeah. Yep. Building kind a story, of. and that way people understand what's going on. Or with an out-of-state hunt like that, I think I might have talked about the tags. Being a non-resident, like what it takes to get a tag, and what some of the obstacles and options are. That way, you know, not only hopefully are you, you know, educating people. That way they can like replicate it. Like if that's something they're interested in, like they understand the situation and, and what's going on. So there's a lot yeah. to building that story. Not only you know, what, where you're going, what you're doing, um, but also like any, you know, previous history with that spot, you know, that, that's an area that we've hunted a long time. My family has hunted in the past. So that, that one, there was a lot to build into yeah. that story. But you were giving a lot of context. So like mm -hmm. those were all things that you knew beforehand and you might not have even thought to told, to tell people that, but you're giving context to the viewers. All right. This is what people would find interesting. This is what they might want to know. And it also contributes to the hunt as a whole. 
Exactly. So you've started building your story and, and, and you've got it up and running with a couple interviews, some B-roll and all that. But once you get to the woods, what are some key things that cause you to pull out your camera when you're walking and looking for a tree or you're looking for somewhere to set up on the ground uh, that are worth recording and you think are a part of the big story? Yeah, I mean, really it is, again, just advancing the story and anything that's a part of it, uh, anything that's going into the strategy, anything that you see along the way, if you're maybe like scouting your way in, any sign that you're finding, anything that's relevant to the story, um, that's what I'm going to be recording. Uh, maybe we can talk about it a little bit later too, but I got, you know, some of the equipment that, uh, that, we, that I use here when I'm self-filming. And the idea when I'm walking in or just self-filming in general is to be ready at all times. So I got like, you know, a GoPro ready that I can do a quick interview. Anything that catches my eye and that's of interest of me, I'm going to film on the way in. Mm -hmm. But I try not to get too bogged down with doing shots where like maybe I set the camera up and I walk by it and then I got to walk back and get the yeah. camera. Trying to be efficient with self-filming is a big deal and that's why... Um, you know, I can, I can put this rig together later on here, but just having a GoPro rig that I can talk and, and just keep moving and show more interactively of what I'm seeing and what I'm thinking. I've noticed that like you must film quite a bit of stuff that you never use because mm -hmm. you don't have any, any way of knowing if the, the scrapes that you're seeing or the rubs that you're seeing or any of that, exactly. the transition lines, you don't really know if that's going to play into the hunt. Yep. But you're filming those things knowing that they might play into the hunt. Exactly. And that way you can use that footage later on. You bet. Okay, so this next question I have kind of plays right into that. And, you know, and when you're walking into a new piece, it's difficult because you're analyzing constantly, trying to mm -hmm. figure out what your next step is while you're trying to capture it. So do you have any, like, tips or, like, how do you balance that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that is tricky. It is It is a balance. The thing, you know, personally, I, I love filming. I love videography. I love the whole process. So for me, it's, it's easier. Like I don't ever feel like it's a, a huge burden because I enjoy doing it. You know, for somebody that, that maybe is not as into it as I am, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years and not only that, it's part of my job. It's part of what we do is, is recording these hunts and, and being able to, uh, you know, have a finished product that has, you know, everything you need for a quality episode. So for me, it's not that big of a burden. Um, Again, I think just being uh, just efficient with it um, goes back to the gear that you have and just and just repetition and being used to um, to knowing what you need to put everything together. And I think a huge a huge thing is for somebody that's doing this is is editing your own footage, which most people probably are, mm -hmm. and knowing what you need to tell the story. You know that as I'm you know progressing through the hunt, telling the story. You know I, I know if I need certain b-roll shots to show what I'm talking about so mm -hmm. basically my process is editing in my head as I go right yeah whether I, I'm self-filming yeah. or filming somebody else do you think that it's important to to kind of have reasonable expectations and um, yeah and try and focus on what you really really need to capture the hunt yeah exactly and a lot of that's going to go back to your goals of what you're trying to produce in the end maybe maybe shooting a deer is more important to you than getting a you know great footage of it all so maybe you're going to lean towards more towards being efficient with hunting and, and worry less about the filming part of it. And in some situations, you know, if you end up shooting something and we've had to do this in the past where, we, where we've been in a hurry is you end up having a successful hunt and you got to go back and recreate some of that, that mm -hmm. footage the next day, or hopefully you know, sometime where you have similar conditions. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I think having realistic goals and expectations and knowing your limitations is helpful as well. I just noticed when I get done watching one of your videos, I feel like I was part of the experience, and obviously that's mm -hmm. your goal is for the viewers to feel like they're on the hunt with you. Exactly. What do you think is different um, in your hunts compared to a lot of other hunts that you see out there, whether it's on YouTube, on TV, or whatever, that really makes the audience feel like they're there? Because I've experienced it, hmm. and it and it's uh, and I feel like there's a little special something there. But I'm not sure well, what it is. That's good. I think a lot of it goes back to that 25 years of experience. Like I've just been doing this for a long time. I'm passionate about it, and you know, for the past 10 years, it's been part of my job. So it's you know, it's a responsibility to be able to capture all these elements of the hunt, to put it together to where people feel like they they understand what's going on. You know, hopefully they're entertained, and they just feel like they're there with you. So part of it is just filming everything you need to be able to tell the story, but also that doing it in a way and, and taking advantage of equipment, especially the kinds of equipment that we have nowadays, that helps you tell that 
a more immersive story. And a lot of that comes from like the GoPro type cameras, like mm. kind of that first person point of view cameras. You can have head mounts, you can have chest mounts to where people are kind of seeing things the way you see things. I think that that can be a big part of it. Um, go, I'm thinking back to uh, the buck that I shot with the muzzleloader in Iowa last year. Uh, you know, once I'm up in the stand, I'm showing, basically showing everybody that what I'm seeing, you know, I got the GoPro right there and I'm just like, like pointing everything out, kind of first person point of view mm. to where they can see and you know, understand exactly what I'm thinking. Yeah. So I, I think that's part of it. And, you know, maybe another part of it is again, going back to the fact that I just love filming, I love video, video production, um, you know, just filming all the different things that catch my eye, whether it's um, a squirrel chewing on a walnut or just beauty shots, panning the sun dipping below the horizon, you know, all the, all those different things that when a person goes out and hunts, they notice, um, you know, I try to capture those on camera as well and, you know, and put those and make that part of the overall production. For sure. Looks like Greg is getting his stuff <laughs> out here for the last question, which is for you guys, what are some practical steps that you and I can take, um, to capture our hunts better? Yeah, I think again, we've been talking about it all along here, just going back to some of the camera equipment and, the GoPro cameras and the 360 camera, which I have here, have been huge for us. You know, really when I'm self-filming, I, I probably use these cameras way more than I do the main camera. That's interesting. For sure. Basically from the beginning, you know, maybe driving out or walking in, getting ready, these cameras are super, super helpful for getting those B-roll shots and kind of setting up the story and, and stuff like that. And that's, you know, I talked about you know, keeping things moving forward and not getting bogged down in one spot for too long. That's a nice thing about you know, having a, a selfie stick like this and, and just, you know, as you're walking in, you know, talk, you know, setting up the story, talking about what's going on, you know, anything that you see as you're going in, it all, it all comes back to efficiency. And these kinds of cameras, this is a 360 here and just, you know, GoPro here. And then another thing on the audio side of it, which is really important to your production as well, is a digital recorder. I've noticed that. So, uh, it's, you know, it, it's pretty simple. It's just powered by a AAA battery. It'll last for about 10 hours. Power it on, and it captures audio through the lav mic onto an SD card in the recorder. And then you can pair that with every camera angle, right? Yep. And you can, it, again, it's a, it'll be an extra step in post-production, mm -hmm. syncing up audio. But that's especially handy, like, when you're you know, if you're doing an interview, let's say like with this 360 camera, this doesn't have the greatest audio on its own. So that way you can, uh, you have good clean audio. So with some of these action cameras and stuff, like you said, the quality isn't gonna be top notch cinema ne necessarily, um, which is your guys' style. That's not necessarily everyone's style, but that's how you guys do things. And I really enjoy your guys' videos because you, like I said, you really do feel like you're there. and. And this is obviously how you guys do that. So I think that's yeah. really awesome. And I think you guys, hopefully you could learn something um, from all of this. Uh, I know I'm going to watch this back several times probably and, and hopefully make some adjustments. But uh, thanks for taking some time. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, my pleasure. And hopefully we can all uh, up our, our film game um, because of this. So thanks, Greg. Absolutely. Thank you. Right, right.